Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I want to talk a little bit about music in Jane Austen's time. Before I talk about music in Jane Austen's time, I would like to introduce the Spotify playlist that I created of music from Jane Austen's time and it is linked in the description box. I suggest that you check it out now, go click the link, open up the playlist, shuffle it and then you have some background music for this very video without me getting into any copyright trouble. So uh, I will talk specifically about the music on the playlist in the second half of this video. The first half of the video, which I think is the more interesting half, is going to be about music in Jane Austen's time generally. So I will uh, cite and quote various people and they will all be linked in the description box if you want to check out those sources. When you try and figure out what the deal is with music in Jane Austen's time, then try and think about who plays music in Jane Austen's novels. Think of all the characters that you can think of who play music and you'll soon realize that the huge majority of them are women. In fact, there are only two men in all of her novels that are described as performing music and that's John Willoughby from Sense and Sensibility and Frank Churchill from Emma. The huge majority of musical performers in Jane Austen's books are women and they're all slightly different. There are some really talented performers like Jane Fairfax and Georgiana Darcy and Marianne Dashwood and there's also some that are not so talented like poor Mary Bennett. There's women who play music but I described as being a little bit more lazy about it, like uh, Emma Woodhouse from Emma and Elizabeth Bennet from Pride and Prejudice. But women playing music are everywhere in Jane Austen's novels. And that is because women made up the huge majority of amateur musicians in Britain around 1800. I'm going to blend in some pictures of uh, female musicians and uh, all of these are contemporary art from around 1800. Most of them are from the first three decades of the 19th century. And that will show you that the typical amateur musician in that time was female, young, unmarried, and came from a so-called genteel family. Quick note on what I mean when I say genteel or upper class, and that typically describes a family in which the women didn't have to work. So the women, and by work I mean work inside or outside of the home. So the housework would be done by servant staff and uh, they wouldn't have to work to make money or to uh, keep the household intact because they had people doing that for them. But back to the musicians in Austen's novel, there is the one word that you will find a lot in her books to describe women in general and that is accomplished as in accomplished young ladies. Here's one example from Pride and Prejudice, and this is a conversation between Charles Bingley and his sister. It is amazing to me, said Bingley, how young ladies have patience to be so very accomplished as they all are. All young ladies accomplished? My dear Charles, what do you mean? Yes, all of them, I think. They all paint tables, cover screens and net purses. I scarcely know anyone who cannot do all this, and I am sure I never heard a young lady spoken of for the first time without being informed that she was very accomplished. And then later Caroline Bingley's definition of accomplished goes a step further and she says, no one can be really esteemed accomplished who does not greatly surpass what is usually met with. A woman must have a thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, all the modern languages to deserve the word. And besides all this, she must possess a certain something in her air and manner of walking, the tone of her voice, her address and expressions, or the word will be but half deserved. So that's a, that's a pretty long list of things. That's a pretty long checklist for a young lady to be considered accomplished by Caroline Bingley. But actually, that checklist was very typical for her time. Of course, in Pride and Prejudice, this is slightly played for laughs, but the word accomplishment was a bit of a buzzword at the time, and it described a certain set of skills and activities that young women were expected to be skilled at in order to be considered accomplished. Maria Edgeworth, who's a novelist from that time, who also wrote education manuals, uh, she said this about accomplishments. Every young lady, 
and every young woman is now a young lady, has some pretensions to accomplishments. She draws a little, or she plays a little, or she speaks French a little. Really, if you think about it from a 21st century perspective, I'm gonna wait till Beatles finish scratching at the litter box before I continue this. Really, if you think about this from a 21st century perspective, things like drawing, dancing, performing music and netting a purse are completely different skills. They're, com they're completely different hobbies. So what connects them all under the umbrella term of accomplishment? Well, I think that there are four characteristics that make an activity an accomplishment in the early 19th century sense of the word. First, they are all domestic activities. These are all things that young women could practice and perform within the home. That's pretty self-explanatory because the home was the place of the woman back then. Public life was for men. Women would only go out in public for entertainment purposes or for shopping. They wouldn't really have any business outside of their home uh, except in other people's homes. So there was a lot of visiting each other going on back then. But usually the women's place was considered the home. The second characteristic is that they're all, all of these activities are incredibly time consuming. It takes a long time to sew and to embroider. It takes a long time to learn French or German. It takes a really long time to master a musical instrument. And that was one of the main features of accomplishment. They had to keep women occupied during the day. Thirdly, all of these things are quite expensive. And I don't just mean expensive in the sense that buying a piano is expensive or Buying paint and canvas is expensive, but it's expensive to learn these things. Uh, education is costly. It still is today, and it certainly was back in the 19th century. And the fourth characteristic of accomplishments, in my opinion, is that all of them were performative. And music, dancing, singing were more obviously performative because, well, you sit down and you sing a little song or you play a little piece on the piano. That's just straight up performing something. But drawing, uh, handicrafts, all of these other accomplishments are things that you can then show off. So if you uh, paint a landscape, you then have a painted landscape that you can show to other people. Or if you embroider a cushion, you then have a cushion that you can show to other people. Uh, if you speak French, then maybe you can say a poem in French to show to other people that you can speak French. So all of these activities are meant to be performed in one way or another. When we think of music in that context, music as an accomplishment, it really exemplifies all four of these characteristics. It's domestic, I mean, music doesn't have to be domestic, but in this context it was. It's very, very time consuming to practice and master an instrument. It's very expensive to do so, and it's the most performative of all of the accomplishments. Education of wealthy girls from genteel families took place mainly in the home. And that meant that it was particularly expensive because parents who wanted their daughter to learn an instrument needed enough money to buy the instrument. And I mean, there are cheaper and more expensive instruments, but one of the most popular instruments at the time was the pianoforte, which was brand new in the early 19th century. And that certainly wasn't cheap. They had to hire a teacher and by teacher, uh, they could pick really between a music master. This was usually a male teacher who would come into the home to give lessons and then leave again. But there was also the option of hiring a live-in governess. And a lot of wealthy families would have both. The governess was expected to teach music as well. So if you look at, uh, at ads, for example, in the Times from the early 19th century, Every single advert that uh, was a governess advertising her services would list what instruments she could teach. As an educator, the governess was expected to teach music along with other accomplishments. Another way that a family had to be rich in order to allow their daughter to learn an instrument was that they had to have the leisure to allow the girl to practice for hours and hours 
without her having to earn money, like girls would have to in working class families. So why did families invest all of this time, money and effort just so their daughter could perform music within domestic contexts? We're not even talking about public concerts here. We're talking about living room parties. Well, if you have read Jane Austen, then I'm pretty sure you can you can think of a reason why girls would practice and perform music, and it is, of course, to find a husband. And this is the bit that we, from our 21st century perspectives, often get wrong. When I say women played music to find a husband, I'm not saying that men were so enthralled by the sweet sounds of a young lady singing at the piano. That wasn't the case. The reason why a young woman singing at the piano made her more attractive is because the possible suitor then knew that she must have money. Because of all the reasons that I've just listed. Musical performance was an asset. It was a symbol of status, class, wealth and education. For example, if we go back to Jane Austen, Emma doesn't have to be very good at the piano because she is incredibly wealthy and doesn't intend to marry. Another character from Emma, Mrs. Elton, uh, says in passing that she gave up the piano after she got married. And that was very common back then because once you're married, why play music when you've already achieved the goal that the music was intended for? If we go to Mary Bennett from Pride and Prejudice, she is desperate to stand out among her four sisters. And since she doesn't have the beauty or the intelligence or the wit of her other sisters, music is what she is focusing on to give her the best chance at standing out and finding a nice Mr. Collins to uh, snare in. So let's move on to the question of what music was played. So far I've only vaguely talked about musical performance, but let's get specific here. We're talking about a society in which every pastime, every hobby, every activity is heavily gendered, and music was one of them. So some aspects of music, like composition, analysis, music history, were not taught to women at all because they were considered masculine. That's why even though there were some female composers at the time, that's why the majority of compositions coming out of Britain in that time were composed by men. Musical performance, especially in domestic contexts, was a woman's pursuit. There was also a heavy divide between professional musicianship and amateur musicianship. Professional musicians, who could be men or women, were often foreigners, for example, and they were basically a whole other social class and were uh, treated in a completely different way. We're talking here about amateur musicians performing in the home, and they were women. But not all instruments were considered suitable for young women. The author Elizabeth Appleton, who wrote an educational manual with the title Private Education in 1816, she lists some of the instruments that she considers appropriate for young women. Pianoforte, harp, guitar, harmonica, harp lute, castanets and tambourine. I have to say the, the last few are a bit weird. I, I've not read any other source that lists the castanets as a particularly feminine instrument, and I can't imagine young women spending hours and hours practicing the tambourine, so I think those two were maybe more just for fun additional instruments, but the first three in particular, pianoforte, harp and guitar, these are the three main instruments that I read about over and over again in that context. Funnily enough, there are instruments that today we consider quite feminine, mostly because they are played by a majority of women. If you think, for example, of the flute, you probably won't be able to think of a lot of male flute players, but back in the early 19th century that was a completely different story. Uh, there was a, an author called N.W. James, a male author, who wrote an article with the title A Word or Two on the Flute, back in 1826, and in that article he explains why he considers the flute extremely unsuitable for a lady. This is it. 
Indeed, it can hardly be recommended or expected that the professors of fair faces and soft swelling lips should consent to puff out the one and conceal the other by the use of the flute, while such a display of all the charms of grace and beauty wait upon the use of the harp. Context. Context is key to understanding how domestic music was used in Jane Austen's time. Women performed to a private audience at social gatherings in private homes. Men were usually in the audience. In fact, they were usually the intended audience, but they could join in under specific circumstances. Uh, but they too were restricted to specific instruments such as the violin, the cello and the aforementioned flute. Those, believe it or not, were considered masculine enough for the men to enjoy. The women had to achieve two things with their musical performance. Convince the men that they were wealthy and well-educated, as explained previously, and also look decorative while doing so. Performance of music and performance of gender and performance of sexuality were all very intricately linked. So a woman playing the flute was considered ugly, never mind the phallic connotations, therefore women were not allowed to play the flute. It is that simple. Grace and beauty, elegance, that was what the women had to achieve with their musical performance. But don't get me wrong, these women were amazing performers, uh, spending hours every day practicing, starting playing an instrument at a very young age and becoming really rather virtuosic. And this shows in the music that they played too. For example, there was one genre of composition that was huge in the day, and that's something called the accompanied piano sonata. And this was a piece of music that was composed for piano and one accompanying instrument. The accompanying instrument was often flute or the violin. And the main feature of these sonatas is that the piano is the main instrument. The piano plays the difficult bits, the piano gets all of the attention and the violin would just be accompanying and that is completely the other way around of what we think of when we think of a piano and violin duo but that was to show off the female performer the female performance was the main part of musical performance when men joined in they were they were accompanying they were helping out they were joining in for social reasons men did not spend that much time practicing either so this is the bit where we move on to the spotify playlist that i created and uh, the examples that i put on there because i tried to be as authentic as possible in the choices of pieces that i put on the playlist though i had difficulties because a lot of the music that i have just discussed has never been recorded, or if it's been recorded, it's not on Spotify. So it's not as authentic as I want it to be. The other thing is I just couldn't resist sticking some of, of our top hits of classical music in there. So you will find the odd Mozart, the odd Beethoven, I think I might have even snuck a Schubert in there. Those are the composers from that time, from the turn of the century that we know and love but they were not the composers that were mostly played by women of that time. So there are a lot of composers there that you might not be familiar with, but who were in fact hugely popular. For example, uh, Dussek, Giuliani, uh, Voricek. There's lots of um, European composers that were played all over the place, including in Britain. I also tried to stick with mainly domestic music that is chamber music and solo music that would have been performed within the home. So you'll find a lot of piano, harp, guitar, uh, any of these combined with voice or string instruments or flutes. So the kind of music that could conceivably have been played in the home. However, to mix it up a bit, I also sprinkled in some of the music that Jane Austen and her heroines may have heard while out in public, either in the ballrooms of Bath or maybe the opera houses of London. So there is some orchestral music and some operatic music in there as well. Uh, though I think it will be very easy for you to distinguish between the music that Jane Austen may have played and the music that Jane Austen may have listened to in an opera house. 
there were some very popular forms of composition. The sonata and sonatina was very popular. Also variations on popular themes and melodies, including popular melodies composed by more famous composers. And, and also folk songs and uh, folk tunes. Though I couldn't find many that were historically accurate because even though some of the songs that I know were performed back then have been recorded, they're usually recorded in a modern pop folk type way. But like I said earlier, a lot of the music that I was looking for, I couldn't find because much of it just hasn't been recorded yet. And a lot of that is down to tastes changing. For example, the accompanied piano sonata I mentioned earlier, the type of music where the piano takes the main stage and the violinist is only accompanying, there aren't many of those about. There's one notorious piece that I unfortunately couldn't find on Spotify but that I wanted to mention here and that's a piece called The Battle of Prague by uh, Frantisek Kotswara and I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that so apologies. This is a piano piece from the late 18th century and it was famous because it was incredibly noisy and incredibly popular with young ladies at the time but at the same time quite a bad composition. I can see why something like the Battle of Prague would have been popular because the pianoforte, which is what the piece is for, was very new at the time so before that on keyboard instruments you couldn't really do dynamics, you couldn't play loud and quiet notes but with the invention of the pianoforte, which became more and more popular at the turn of the 19th century, those kind of dynamics became really fashionable because for the first time you could play loud and quiet notes on a keyboard instrument. Some of the instruments that might surprise you include the classical guitar. There's a lot of guitar music on my playlist and not many people know that the guitar was hugely trendy in the first decades of the 19th century and hugely trendy with young women. Men, at least amateurs, British men, didn't really play the guitar back then. But it was quite big with young women and I included some of the music they may have played on that playlist. Though I'm a little bit biased because I myself am also a guitarist. <laughs> I say even though I haven't touched my guitar in about a year. If you have any questions at all about any of the things that I have talked about in this video, post them in the comments. I'm very happy to answer them to the best of my abilities. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you in the comments. This is something I really love talking about and I'm so glad that this gives me the opportunity to make a video on this very booktube channel about music in Jane Austen's time. Also, if you have any suggestions for specific pieces that uh, you think would fit on that playlist, Again, post them in the comment and I'll check them out and see if they're on Spotify and I'll see if, if they could go on the playlist. Let me know all of your thoughts. Let me know your favourite Austen musician. Let me know your favourite 19th century composer. Let me know if there's anything that you've learned in this video that you found interesting or that you didn't know before. And if I said anything that was blatantly wrong, then please go and correct me. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!